I'm Dan Rasmussen. I ranch, live on a family ranch in southern Mullet County. Um, the ranch that my grandfather homesteaded, I'm the third generation, fourth generation is, is here. So we're going to talk about uh, drought planning, but in this segment, it's going to be drought planning from the uh, early days. Um, on this ranch, that would be 30 years ago when we started uh, more intensive grazing management. Hello, my name is Tans Herman. I'm with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. I'm here with Dan Rasmussen of the 33 Ranch to discuss drought planning, uh, but also the factors associated with the drought status that we're currently in throughout most of our state. We want to provide some resources from the Grassland Coalition and partners to folks that are struggling to make some hard decisions and, and lay the groundwork for being prepared for the next time it's dry because uh, by the grace of God it will rain again and, and we'll see some normal conditions moving forward at some point, whether that's this year or two years from now, we'll uh, eventually get back to uh, a situation where folks are pretty happy about what they're doing. Dan, take it away. Thank you, Tans. So we're going to do this in two segments and uh, going to start with the before the drought segment right now. And the next one will be uh, uh, working through a drought plan. Uh, what, what trigger dates and goals. So before the drought, uh, what we our goal, the goal would be to have healthy soil and healthy rangeland. And so now on this, on this uh, um, visual here, this sheet, we have a line going across. On the left side of the line is season-long grazing. On the right-hand side of the line is more um, uh, rotational grazing. And as you move, the way I've got this set up, as you move to the right, you go from season-long to a slow rotation, faster rotation, and a more management intensive grazing. So the, the point of this is that everybody is on this line someplace and that is determined by your resources, whether it is uh, financial, time, um, um, labor, uh, and, and so forth. And so it's not like we're comparing one to the next, it's just some people, the best place to be is over here. And some people, some ranches, the best place is farther to the right. But understanding that as you move to the right through improve, increased management, the organic matter gets higher in the soil. Soil water infiltration gets better. Plant diversity goes up and stocking rate can potentially in time go up. Over on this side is just the opposite. Organic matter is going down if you're in a season long grazing situation. Soil water infiltration is going down. Plant diversity is going down. Stocking rate is going down. So if you're on this side of the line, you're over here farther, you're gonna be able to withstand, uh, your pastures will be able to withstand a drought better than if you're over here. Uh, season long over grazing is the using a season long um, approach, having cattle in from say the first of May to the last day of October in the same pasture. And as palatable plants are growing, the cattle are grazing them off and then they regrow, cattle come back and, and regraze that nutritious, easy to digest leaf. There are plants that are, are often just not even grazed because they have the cattle have missed their palatable time. So you can look across a pasture, a season-long pasture, and see some pretty, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good grass there. But on closer inspection, the, there are areas that are overgrazed and plant species, and that reduces the plant diversity. So over here. Plants get more rest, plant diversity goes up. You have shallow rooted plants and deep rooted plants that take advantage of moisture profiles. As organic matter goes up, 
it holds this soil will hold water. Uh, one percent of organic matter can increase the um, uh, infiltration rate uh, by about um, was it like one inch of rain. So um, it's not it's very common for uh, pasture rangeland in this area on the graph to be in the 1% organic matter and over in this area to be 2 or 3% or higher. And uh, so um, improved grazing practices build soil health and the management must give the pastures time for soil to become healthier before increasing stocking rates. This can take years to go from here to here. And we're talking about it now because this is a good time to be thinking if you're over on this side, how do you get, make progress to move farther to the right? Management um, uh, or holistic resource management is a very good uh, educational tool to learn how to make this move. And uh, it's never uh, indicated that it should be done overnight. It uh, takes time. Um, education is the key to learning how to move to the right on this line graph. Hello there. We're here again with Dan Rasmussen of the 33 Ranch talking about an actual written drought plan and the value it has not only for this ranch, but the value that we're trying to convey to folks that, that a written drought plan or contingency plan, whatever name you want to associate with it, uh, how it can really help you in times of crisis like we're in, uh, make some decisions that are difficult to make in the right priority order so that uh, you don't regret things later. Thank you, Tans. Um, this is the drought plan that my brother-in-law and partner and I, Blake Lehman, put together in the year 2000 when we went to the Ranching for Profit School. Since then, we have implemented this plan. This would be the third time. Uh, and we have changed it a little bit. And we've, I've learned that as you go through a drought, it's a learning experience. And you become a little smarter about how to go into and come out of and survive the next one. So I'll go through the main points on our drought plan. Our, drought plan. our overall goal um, is to protect the land and, to, uh, and the resource, which is soil and grass, for wildlife and for our cattle, and to keep the core cow herd intact. And to explain that a little further, we, uh, it's a cow-calf operation. We, we have um, yearlings that are, some are commodity, some are organic uh, that we sell through the summer. And we have a um, custom yearling herd usually too. So we can, we can start selling yearlings um, uh, early in the year and if in, in a really dry year or a series of dry years. So our, Kind of these aren't all in in the, the in, in a order of priority, but I would say that leaving adequate standing forage to supply litter uh, for the for soil health is is the main priority. Now we work off of that by measuring the what we leave behind, which uh, the goal is to leave 12 to 1500 pounds of forage per acre. And some of the, sometimes we measure this with the grazing stick and sometimes clipping, but um, that's the goal. Uh, during a drought year, that, that number can go down to 800 pounds per acre, and which NRCS defines that as main, maintenance, maintaining what you have. As, but to, to keep improving soil health, uh, you need more than 800 pounds. Um, so, Maintaining adequate litter in the pastures is a result of the amount of rain forage you leave behind when you come out of the pasture. Um, we, uh, um, part of this, uh, once the, part of this grout plan is that once we have a dry year, if the, if the soil's healthy enough, uh, it's a lot easier to go through that first one. 
But once you've been through one and it looks like the next consecutive year is going to be dry, then we start implementing with trigger dates. Um, down here, I have the trigger dates for, for destocking is we sell cows in the winter. And next we start selling yearlings and we sell those classes of yearlings, uh, organic commodity, uh, purchased yearlings, um, home raised yearlings and, uh, and custom ones in, in an order that, that, that is the best for whatever market we have. But, uh, second year into a drought, we start looking April 1st, uh, to start getting out from under some of the yearlings. Then a year like this, we may be all done with the yearlings by the middle of May in 2004, they were all gone by the 20th of May. Um, Back to our overall goal, if we can keep that cow herd, that basic core cow herd, uh, the most productive cows intact, that's, uh, that's, our, that's our goal. So another goal is to avoid um, being backed into a corner and making decisions that you don't want to, you know, that are going to hurt the business more. Um, planning ahead can avoid that. Um, the, it, it also helps with stress. The um, having a plan and working through this plan in a timely manner can avoid a lot of the stressful parts of going through a drought. We know we're going to have financial hit. That's just a given. But let's think thinking about the land. We need to be destocking at a at an appropriate time so that the soil is is good the land is healthy and our pastures are in reasonable shape so that when it does rain which it will the the grass will will um will grow and grow in a you know quickly this uh, that that's our main goal um reducing stress is a big deal a big part of of drought planning and having a plan puts us in the driver's seat at least from making decisions in a in a low stress environment. Back with Dan Rasmussen on our rapid fire questions. And Dan, I'd like you to tell me the story of, of when you decided you needed to do something in relation to the drought conditions we're currently facing. Thanks, Tans. Um, well, here on the 33 Ranch, we, we started experiencing the the drought conditions in uh, 2021 and it, it was you know pretty evident during the winter that we were gonna we're going into a, a drought and um, by you know we as we got into the summer we started planning to sell our yearlings early and our stocking rate was was good and was accurate enough and our um, and we had, you know, every we had a little more rain than in northwest part of the of South Dakota, which helped us. And so we were, uh, we didn't have to change much, but we did sell our yearlings a month early. So I'd say midsummer 2000, or early summer, late spring 2021, we were all already looking at at what's the next step. All right, Dan, I'm going to ask you some questions. We are asking for some fairly concise answers that may lack some detail. And for our viewers, if something triggers in you and you need more information, uh, the automatic answer is to reach out to the Grassland Coalition, reach out to your local NRCS office or area range specialist for some additional information on those topics. So, number one. Dan, will you speak to the rancher who's out of grass right now and feels like they're out of options? What do you think the first steps they should take are? Well, Tans, the date is 5th of April, I, I believe. And uh, if you're out of grass the 5th of April and uh, have been out of grass you know, all winter and part of last summer, uh, then it's time to destock. And uh, that's already started in South Dakota. There have been West River, there have been a lot of cattle go through the sale barns. But think of it from the plant standpoint. Uh, the drought was stressful. Being grazed during a drought was stressful to the plant. The roots are dying back 
you know, and it's, it's becoming more vulnerable to having um, weeds, other plants, and uh, other grasses to move in annuals, you know, near it. So now if we get a little rain and, uh, uh, you know, an inch of rain and things start growing, and then it's grazed again, and then we're dried out for the summer, that's going to be a, a seriously stressful event for the native grasses and uh, will be very hard on the pasture. What we're looking for is range management that creates resiliency so that when the drought is over and we get a, a rain, the, the grass will come back quickly. Perfect. So it's important then to allow that growth to take effect and, and really not hit those plants until they're at least at that three to maybe four leaf stage so that there is some, some real root reserves built through photosynthesis. Uh, as tempting as it is to hit that green lush grass, and we know how livestock are. Mm -hmm. They are leaning on the fences to get out and, and get onto that lush growth. Uh, for the long-standing performance of the, the range resource on any given ranch, it's important to give that as much of a chance to grow as possible. And I, I think, Tans, that we just keep need, needing to ask the question, what does nature want us to do? And give take the stress off the plants is is really what nature wants this time of year yeah, yeah. if we look at the historic uh, buffalo migrations they weren't on every acre of green spring growth all the time right so certainly if you yep. if you've got livestock and you need to be on pasture because your feed resources are gone uh, make careful decisions as to what pastures will be utilized and and at what stocking rate and for how long um, those are key considerations for folks. Yep, and destocking in a good rotation can really reduce the time the cattle are on those pastures for that few days. Certainly. Okay. Dan, I hoped that you might be able to help folks uh, recognize where they are themselves uh, with respect to the priority of ranch resources. And I'm curious for the 33 ranch, how you would rank ranch resources such as land, cattle, grass, equipment, uh, and so on, even human resources. Yeah, Tans, the, 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 the range land is probably the most important uh, thing to look at when, when we're talking about drought because that's our bread and butter. And soil health is the key to, to, to coming out of the drought and having more grass to graze during a drought. So uh, for quite a few years, uh, I'd say 30 on this ranch, we've focused on that from the standpoint of wanting to um, improve our, 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 um, our, our range management, um, more, subdividing pastures, uh, rotating more, um, giving the, the, the pastures more rest. And, and that, uh, the, the cattle are actually a tool to, to manage that. We need cattle for healthy land. We need it for, for, our, um, for our income. We need it, you know, the cattle are a great fit to, to uh, pasture management. Um, sheep work too, even goats can work. Um, but we're, uh, so I would say that's the priority, but you know, you change one thing, it affects everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole, the whole um, process of holistic resource management is identifying the, the, the your priorities and then looking at how a change will affect everything else. You know, we have family and uh, financial and and the, the the cattle and livestock and the the, the environment. You know, the land mm -hmm. and um, they're they're all equally important. But when it comes to drought, we have to start focusing first on the plants and plant Certainly. health. Yeah, the land is a lasting legacy. Cattle have a, a, a service life, right? Yes. You're not necessarily married to them. So, wonderful, thank you. And the question is, oh, you started. I did. Sorry. That's okay. This is homemade. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How does the 33 Ranch diversify income streams to protect profitability? Well, from the time we went through the, the ranching for profit school, 
in 2000 and before that, we've looked at different opportunities here to uh, diversify. And, um, and we've tried a few and it's, it's, it's a good thing to do. Be, uh, some, some work and some don't. You know, we tried retail meat and uh, we did that for a while and that, that did work for a while. We're certified organic. And we do have a, 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 a premium on, um, on our, some of our cattle. We keep organic and sell as yearlings. And it gives us a little more flexibility uh, in marketing. We, we certify um, the rest of the, the commodity cattle as NHTC and it, just, it opens some doors. Um, so the premium isn't always as big as I'd like. Uh, but that's, uh, it does open doors to uh, bring, in, bring more people into the, to the marketing part of it. Um, I, I think there's, well, we have yearlings, uh, we have cow calf yearling operation. We can sell our yearlings early in a drought like we're in right now. We can, um, I, I think we can look and we have looked and are open to other classes of cattle. Uh, sheep, goats, the, there's potential there um, since they, uh, especially goats, can uh, eat uh, uh, quite, a, quite a few of the more woody species that are high in tan and the cattle won't eat. We have a lot of uh, cedar trees and oak trees and uh, ash and elm on this place. Um, so, and shrubs, mm -hmm. uh, sage, and, um, and so we're, we're uh, I think it's a good idea to be open to that. Uh, if this drought uh, persists, I, that's probably, uh, we'll look harder at those, mm -hmm. those options. Some conversations to have with the other stakeholders in the ranch. Yes. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Great. I think everyone would agree, Dan, that uh, there's uncertainty in the ag world. Um, what will markets do for the commodities that I raise? Um, there's conflict uh, overseas. Will this drought last or are we headed into a, a more normal spring? Um, even in that situation, there might be lowered forage production just because of the dry summer that we had in 2021. I'd like to know how do you make decisions in an environment where you don't know the future, um, but you do have the track record of the past to, to work from? Yeah, Tans, that's, that's the life we live. You know, we don't know what the cattle market is going to be six months from now. And uh, we certainly don't know what the weather will be. So we have to look back and uh, look back at what's, what's happened in the last year from the drought standpoint. And behind you is a drought plan and have a drought plan with trigger dates so that it takes the weight off your shoulders of trying to figure out what's coming. We can look back now and say that, uh, okay, we've had a year of, of really serious drought, West River. Our soil profile is very dry going down deep. Um, so we know we're behind the eight ball just starting out. So, uh, the, with, with that uncertainty, uh, NOAA has a, a prediction, you know, for through September of being below um, a moisture, normal moisture levels and uh, above average for, um, for temperature. So if they're right, then we're really behind the eight ball. And looking at it from the plant standpoint, they've already been stressed. The plants have been stressed. They've uh, last year, 2021, and uh, some of these, uh, some areas of the state had, it, were dry in 20. So uh, looking forward, I, I like to ask the question, what does nature want us to do? And nature wants us to protect those plants. And, uh, and, and so make decisions based on how are we going to come out of this drought when it does rain with some vitality in the pastures and, uh, and, and destocking, um, lowering numbers so that they can have more rest in, in the rotation is, uh, is a great way to do it. Good. Dan, is there a minimum amount of surface protection or plant litter or residue that you aim to maintain on the ranch and, and why is that? Yeah, so litter is last year's plants fallen down, um, incorporated on the top of the soil. That provides the protection that we uh, that, that that the soil needs for the bugs. And so a, a good um, 
estimate of, of how and what I use, uh, how much to leave, is to is a handful, a heaping handful of litter out of a square foot. So you take your feet and make a 90 degree and a square, you know, one foot on each side and just dig up the litter. And if you've got a handful of litter or two handfuls, that's about 900 pounds, 900 to 1,000 pounds per acre. That's a good rule of thumb. That leaves protection, that, that's ground cover. Um, so looking in your pasture and seeing bare ground plants is gonna be, uh, is not good for the soil. And you're gonna see problems come from that. If there's, if there's uh, litter and protection on the soil, when the rain hits it, we, they, it doesn't erode, the, doesn't wash soil away, that provides food for the bugs and it cools the, the soil off. Um, I, I've seen people that have these little bearing temperature guns, that thermometers, they can shoot a laser at the bearing on, your, on, on a machine and get a temp back. And if you shoot that on the ground, point that on the ground, on bare ground on a 100 degree day, the ground can be as high as 120 degrees. And if you pull the litter away and, and, do, and check the temperature, it can be in the 80s or low 90s. So as that temperature gets higher, the soil biology stops. And ideal soil biology temp, you know, is in the 80 degree range, 78, 80, you know, within five or 10 degrees. But then, so we're, it's really dramatic that what that protection can do to uh, in, just extend your, um, the, 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 the amount of time that the, the, the roots are actually doing something growing mm -hmm. and, and uh, creating organic matter and just biological, all the good things that, that the bugs do. Certainly. And, and we could probably also safely say that that, that litter cover is a protection from evaporation. It's like a, a, an umbrella for us sitting in the park on a hot sunny day yes. uh, or a blanket in the winter time uh, to keep, keep some warmth in so that biology continues to work. And that is the future organic matter in the soil. And as that organic matter goes up, 1% to 2% to 3% to 4%, each percent in, uh, will, will give you, what is it, 28,000 gallons of storage capacity in that acre, or it's about a one inch of rain. And that's a lot of difference. 1% to 5% is four inches of rain that would have normally run off down the creek, mm -hmm. ended up in the Missouri. That's right. That's money in the bank. Just doesn't have a dollar sign associated with it until you go to market. Yeah. <laughs> to build off of that last question, Dan, uh, about plant residue or litter, as we call it, on the soil surface, uh, I can I know folks that would consider that wasted grass. Uh, what benefits does that "quote unquote" wasted grass provide in terms of building resilient soil. So probably the most important thing we can do to look at, at um, pasture management is start with the soil, soil health. Mm -hmm. And that, that gives us the uh, uh, soil that's healthy, uh, absorbs water quicker. It uh, comes back after a drought. When they talk about resilience, resilience is being able to, for a pasture to go dormant during a drought and then come back very strong when, when, when there's rain. That's what nature intended. This native rangeland is built to do that if we work with it. And by working with it, we need to leave some litter and standing forage. And uh, so on this ranch, we, our goal is 12 to 1500 pounds we wanna leave per acre behind when we go out of the pasture for, for that year. You know, and if we were in there for 30 days or 10 days, whatever, that's what we want to leave behind. And uh, what that does is it creates that armor on the soil. That's the future organic matter right there. And, um, and, and so that's really the, the bottom line. Um, how, do we, how do we manage these pastures so that there's adequate rest, and especially West River, adequate rest and standing forage that will that will go down either your cattle knock it down depending on how 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 congregated or how dense the herd is or just snow in nature brings it down because that that works too and then 
makes contact with the soil, covers that bare ground, provides shade, and then the bugs consume it. Mm -hmm. okay. Dan, what does, uh, what does that look like if it's standing forage? Um, what does that look like in terms of inches of, of above ground height to compare to the pounds per acre? So on, on our pastures here, I figure about 225 pounds per inch. And uh, so we're, you know, at 10 inches, that's 200, that's 2250. Um, since, since we like to, we like to leave uh, about, you know, 1200 pounds, um, we're, we're talking about an eight inch um, uh, grass uh, going out and getting, having an average of six to eight inches mm -hmm. left behind. Certainly, and, and not every inch of that plant is, is weighted equally. We know right. that the base of those plants is much heavier than the leaves yeah. towards the top. Um, and that's where the importance of the grazing stick to get the calculations comes from, or uh, better yet, just that clipping where yeah. we clip and weigh. Yeah, and that's ideal. Clipping and, 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 and uh, getting your ground truth in the, 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 those inches. Mm -hmm. You can do it with, uh, like people learn at the grazing school with a scale and a hoop and clippers and, mm -hmm. and drying it out. And it, it is actually pretty simple yeah, process. Is, but but not, all all, not all plant communities are created equally as mm -hmm. far as weight per acre. Uh, and it's different from one ranch to another. So yeah, and we're not, uh, we're not doing research. So we need to just have general, uh, be, be close. And uh, that, that's we, yeah, and that that's why we 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 ground truth the, the grazing stick so we know how many inches there are, and uh, with with a clipping, and and then you don't have to do it every year. You know. All right, Dan. So my job with NRCS is as a, a soil health specialist with a focus on grazing lands and among the things that, that I try to convey to the public and, and to the land managing ranchers of our state is, is that uh, we've got to have the soil covered with residue. We need to minimize or in case of grazing lands optimize disturbance. That would, grazing would be a disturbance to the, to the resource. We need to maximize the living roots in the soil for as many days of the year as possible. We need to enhance diversity wherever possible, and if we're talking about a land use that doesn't always have livestock inherently present, then we need to incorporate livestock wherever possible. Five principles. Residue cover, optimum disturbance, diversity, living roots, and livestock incorporation. So with that framework in mind, and I know you employ those principles here on the 33 Ranch, do you expect your land to recover rapidly when when the drought breaks and favorable conditions return? So Tans, the, that is the kind of a, a million dollar question. And since I can't see into the future, how, f how, how that's gonna play out, we won't know until we get there. But what I do know is past experience. So this ranch was a, a season long grazed ranch in, until 91. And in, in 91, we started with a simple rotations and have added pastures, subdivided paddocks ever since. So what I, we, when we went through the 85 drought, it took, I, it was a long time. It was several years before we got back to normal production, what we thought was normal. Now, um, after we started rotating in 04, we came back much quicker. And that was a similar, similar drought. And 12, we, we snapped back out of that pretty well. Um, I expect that this year uh, we'll, we will even be doing better. You know, I just see an improvement over time uh, by implementing rotational grazing and long rest periods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So along with those factors, I presume that you're you're building that recovery capacity in the plants because you've got more robust roots, um, and living roots of, with the diversity of species, and it's courtesy of grazing management. Um, and, and like you showed us on one of your graphs earlier, you know, there's this progression from on the left season long grazing to on the right management intensive grazing where moves might be as frequently as, as daily or, you know, seven or 10 days or something like that. And, and, uh, 
what you're telling me there is is that just like an athlete, uh, grass needs rest to, yeah. to recover quickly. Yeah, and, and so we figure about 12 months uh, average between grays here. Uh, sometimes, you know, since we, we kind of move things around, uh, we, we could be in uh, 14 months, some pastures of rest. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, that I think is the key, uh, identifying, understanding your environment, which is going to be different than an environment um, east of Chamberlain. Uh, being out here uh, 130 miles west of Chamberlain, we're, we're in a, a, an environment that, that needs rest and we need a letter, we need protection. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as I think what's going on is that as, we, as the, the longer we do this, the healthier the roots become of these plants. They become, uh, um, there are more plants, the soil's healthier and is able to hold water better. And so when we, it does rain, they're in a good place to take off. But we just have to observe and adapt. That's, that's the job of, of being a, a rancher. Dan, would you talk to us and, and share with us what it looks like on the 33 Ranch? A, how important is planning your annual grazing rotation? And B, what does it look like? So having a grazing plan that serves a lot of purposes. Uh, the, the first thing going into it, and this sounds a little contradictory, but probably your grazing plan will change once you get into the summer. If you're, if you're saying our grazing season starts 1st of May and ends April 31st, okay, you've grazed year round. But uh, there, we just don't know what nature's gonna throw at us. But having the plan in place uh, let you ask the question, what does nature want us to do here? And nature wants us to graze pastures at a different time. So you're, you're adjusting season of use and shuffling them around. Um, sometimes it, you know, from a management standpoint, that's really hard to do. And, but where I see on this ranch where we went, for example, when we changed our calving date to May, from March to May, those pastures uh, went from, from primarily shorter grass to a nice mix, native mix. We start seeing western replaced buffalo grass, um, um, big blue, little blue, side oats, grama start coming into those pastures. They were just being hit too hard when those, when those grasses were vulnerable in early May and, and, uh, and late in early June. So that, uh, just having uh, being set up so that you can adjust season of use is a big deal for for pasture diversity, plant diversity. Um, just I think that everyone's going to understand that. But just to be absolutely clear, when you say the phrase season of use, is it correct to say or, or switch that out with turn in date for any given pasture or paddock? Yeah, so in this place, we're, we, we graze 12 months out of the year uh, with all classes of cattle. And um, so what uh, season of use would be, um, when is that pasture grazed? Is it the 1st of May or is it the 1st of July or is it the 10th of, or the 1st of December? And, um, and if it, every, plant has its its you know its its cycle and it starts out with a tiller a lot of times in the fall and then that tiller gives it that that uh, energy to take off and produce a good plant during the summer well if we graze that tiller in december or november and then expect to graze it again first of may now we've really depleted and stressed the plant so if it's okay to do that graze that tiller in the first of November, but not every year. And if, if we do, it this, do that every year at the same time, even, even not, not going back, it starts decreasing that plant. And uh, so we're, we're putting, we're stressing it. And stressing plants is what nature wants us to do, but only, but then there has to be a rest. And if that rest is adequate, now we've made it better. We've invigorated the roots 
we've, uh, we've, we've transferred some of that plant material to manure and uh, we've got hoof impact. Uh, that's all good stuff. It's just we have to understand these plants need rest and they, they, we need to, to, to figure out how much and graze them at a different time every year. So some ranches will use this period of drought to enhance their ability to weather the next one because we know it's coming, right? Droughts seem to fall in cycles. Uh, by making investments in water infrastructure, pipelines, tanks, maybe a new dam, maybe a new well, things of that nature. Dan, I'd like to know what role water developments play on this ranch. Well, we've got a lot of shallow dams here and uh, there have been through every drought we've been through in the past, I've been through 40 years, they dried up, you know, and um, we still had grass. We had grass that, that, you know, we could graze and maintain pasture health. So the, this has been an ongoing thing on this ranch for my lifetime is uh, more pipelines, you know, getting more uh, uh, um, wells, uh, rural water, that kind of you know sources and uh, what it's what we're accomplishing with it is being able to uh, treat our pastures better um, when if you've got a thousand acre pasture and uh, one dam you, you know where the where the heaviest use is going to be mm -hmm. so with good management you know if you've got we can uh, we, we can keep that that grazing um, pressure kind of distributed throughout the, the ranch better. And this is a good time, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a drought. If, if you don't have good water distribution, then this is a good time to start. You know, I'm, there could be some cost share programs that uh, would help get going. It might be too late for this drought, but uh, certainly it, it's, uh, it's a, a key, key thing in, in uh, maintaining pasture health and uh, keeping cattle on the ranch. Right, Dan, it's a tough time. Folks get a little stressed out when in crisis mode, right? Um, if, if they find themselves in that situation without a plan and without a whole lot of options. So we'd like to know how important personal and business relationships are in a time like this for you. Well, you know, I've been through now a, a few droughts. And one of the things I've noticed is that uh, for sure, as you go, each time we go through it as a ranch, we're a little smarter on the other side of it. We learn something and we're going to learn something, some things, uh, getting through droughts a little easier, uh, on this one. So I think it's a good idea if you haven't been through before serious drought where you were actually managing the money and, and the cattle, it's a good idea to, to talk to somebody that has, you know, a mentor, um, can, can really be valuable. Uh, the grassland coalition has a mentor program. And you can uh, go on the website and there are categories, you know, people there that, uh, so having a team, you know, is, 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 is really critical, uh, from, from the standpoint of managing, you know, having your, the banker, the mineral guy, the, the, the people that buy your cattle, they need to be on your side, you know, have your interest in mind and, uh, if they're not, then they don't belong on your team. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. that's. Dan, you've indicated that, that the 33 Ranch has been implementing rotational grazing strategies, at least in some capacity, since the early 90s, 91 or so. Uh, now, with this many years of experience, 30 plus years in existence, I'm curious what you see the lasting values are of having a grazing and a drought plan in place? Well, a good drought plan starts with a grazing management plan. And um, in, in previous uh, little videos, we've gone through, Tans and I have gone through this sheet, which is uh, shows the, the advantages um, of, of following a grazing plan and and increasing the rest and, and, and litter and uh, protection for the ground. 
and moving to the right on this line um, makes you uh, put you in a, a place during a drought that 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 is is more responsive and uh, the, the pastures will come back after the drought quicker um, the drought plan is just a response a plan to when when it when you dry out you know you just have to respond and uh, sometimes making a decision is the hardest thing to do a uh, drought plan really takes that weight off your shoulders and uh, makes these decisions and planning uh, easier. So long term, uh, a drought plan is really just a good grazing plan with some trigger dates put in.